<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sydney Writers' Festival session uh, with the extraordinary Gary Steingart. He has been variously described as the funniest writer in America, the unlikely love child of uh, Anton Chekhov and Judd Apatow, I read somewhere. Uh, when his first book, The Russian Debutant's Handbook, came out, uh, one review said, uh, as first novels go, Steingart's top Saul Bellows for bounce and Philip Roth's for wit. Uh, so he's better than both of them, also Martin Amos, also many other people. Please make him very welcome, Gary Steingart. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And he's in part here today to talk about his new book, Little Failure, which is a bit of a departure because it's a memoir. Mm -hmm. um, what did you decide? You, there wasn't enough of you in your first three books? You wanted to really <laughs> let rip? Yeah, uh, by the way, it's great to be here. This is a really nice town. Uh, I've eaten in 28 restaurants in three days. <laughs> uh, I am getting to be a little quirky, and I like it. Um, why a memoir now? Why not never, is what you're asking? Um, I mean, the short answer is I needed to build a pool. Uh, so I thought, ka-ching. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the longer answer, I guess, is, you know, I've been writing about small, furry, Russian, Jewish nebishes for three books. And, I, and then one day I looked in the mirror and I said, hey, that's me. <laughs> I've been writing about me. Uh, and that doesn't require a lot of imagination. So I thought, it's time to get rid of all the goods in the larder. There's nothing le else left about me after you finish reading this book. Um, the first interview I had with this book was uh, the wonderful Francine Prose at Interview Magazine. And when she finished reading, she said, I know you better than my husband, Howie, who I've been married to for 20 years. Uh, so after this, I can't write about myself anymore because there's nothing left, so I can write about more interesting people. I'm interested, though. I mean, uh, those quotes I mentioned at the start, a lot of reviews of your work focus on what an incredibly funny writer you are, and you are. But your earlier books seem uh, driven by rage, driven by frustration, driven by all, all these kind of other qualities. The memoir seems to be driven by a kind of note of melancholy. Well, I think like many, I mean, let, let me just say the title, Little Failure, is the nickname my mother used to call me growing up. Uh, so when I was growing up in my 20s and 30s, and I had these tough immigrant parents, and I felt a lot of anger toward them, as immigrant children will do. But in writing this book and in turning older, um, that feeling of anger has been replaced by one of sadness, not for me, but for them and the horrific childhoods that they had in the Soviet Union and adulthoods. Uh, I was interviewing my father for the first four or five memories of his life. His first memory was hiding under a uh, railway car as German bombers strafed it, the Luftwaffe strafed it outside of Leningrad. His second memory is you know, his best friend dying of malnutrition at age three. Uh, his third memory is uh, his uh, aunt jumping out of a window as these gigantic rats, wombat-sized rats pursued her. Uh, and his fourth memory is getting the letter from the, the army saying his father was killed uh, right outside of Leningrad. That's his childhood. You know, and compare it to mine, there's nothing even remotely like it. And that's when I began to realize they can't be but who they are. And that made me feel so uh, sorry for them because they had artistic dreams as well. But growing up in the anti-Semitic Soviet Union in the 1960s and 70s, he wasn't going to be the opera singer that he wanted to be. And she wasn't going to be the pianist. So... The other thing that becomes very clear through the course of the book is you wouldn't have become the writer you are or the person you were were it not for them and the ways in which, um, as challenging as your relationship with them was, they supported you. Well, one of the first things that my father did that was so wonderful was that he would take me outside. Uh, when we moved to America, we were all, you know, we weren't assimilating well, and he would take me for long walks, and he would tell me a series of stories in Russian that he would call the planet of the Yids. Uh, which was about a Jewish planet in, 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 the, in the kosher galaxy um, that was constantly being attacked by the space slobs with their pork torpedoes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you know, this is how satire sort of began for me, the idea that you take a sad situation and you try to make it funny. The, uh, the other thing they did for you was, uh, after you emigrated to the US at the age of seven, they kept speaking Russian around the house. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that 
shaped you as a writer? I think that was the most important thing. Speaking in Russian, which means that the family, that the parents don't speak English as well, because the primary way to learn English is when you have a little child running around saying, screw this, suck that, you know. <laughs> uh, but I wasn't doing that, so that allowed me to keep Russian, which has been very important to all of my works, and is sort of the secondary language, the secondary soundtrack when I write. There's always a little bit of Russian going on in my mind. And the second thing they did was they didn't have a television set. So uh, I would, you know, <laughs> all the kids were watching these, you know, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. You enter our house, it was all Chekhov's lady with lapdog 24-7, uh, which meant I had no friends, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it did encourage me to, I think, uh, to have this sort of communion with words that other, other kids didn't have. And I think there was an episode of Buck Rogers based on Lady with Lapdog, so I think you're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're in the loop there. Well, my grandmother had this TV from the 1950s, possibly the first television ever made, and it either got sound or picture. <laughs> And you had to take the antenna and, and lean your hand out the window. So what I would do is I would uh, get the sound and write down all the dialogue one, one week. And then when it was rebroadcast, I would match the dialogue <laughs> with what was happening on the screen, which is a great exercise for a writer, you know, to try to see how those things fit together. Before we get too far into the interview, I do want you to read a passage from the book, because for all I've focused on the melancholy to kick off, it is still an extremely funny book. Um, I'll read you the non-funny section. Just yeah, to, read the okay. saddest bit you can yeah, find. Okay. That'd be great. <laughs> Bring the mood down. Absolutely. Well, this was uh, this section I'll read. This is after we had just emigrated from uh, the Soviet Union to America. And 1980 was a very difficult time to be a Russian in America. Uh, Ronald Reagan's evil empire speech, some of you may remember. There were all those movies, Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster, everything was red. <laughs> And I pretended, it was so bad to be a Russian, I pretended to the kids in Hebrew school that I was actually born in East Berlin, not in Leningrad. So you know things are bad when you have to convince Jewish kids that you're actually a German. Uh, <laughs> and we had all those stuff we brought from Russia, these giant fur hats and smelly fur coats that didn't, you know, win me any friends. And because I was the red gerbil, the second most hated boy in Hebrew school, I thought, what if I wrote a science fiction novel and showed it to the kids in school? Maybe they'll learn to like me. And this is very sweet. My parents have saved all of these hundreds of pages of, you know, of text that I'd written as a 10-year-old. Uh, this is one is called Invasion from Outer Space. Let's see, chapter one, something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody called child services. Uh, um, and then when I was about 11 years old, a momentous thing happened in the guise of a substitute teacher called Miss S. So I'll read you that section. <clears throat> on one of our first days on the job, Miss S asks us all to bring in our favorite items in the world and to explain why they make us who we are. I bring in my latest toy, this functional Apollo rocket whose capsule pops off with the press of a lever and explain that I have even written my own novel. This passes largely unremarked as the latest batch of Star Wars X-Wing fighters and My Little Ponies are paraded around. Finally, Miss S holds up a sneaker and explains that her favorite activity is jogging. P.U., a boy cries out, pointing at the sneaker and holding his nose. And everyone except me laughs their wicked child laugh. I am shocked. Here is a young, kind, beautiful teacher, and the children are intimating that her feet smell. Only me and my 200-pound Leningrad fur coat are allowed to smell around here. I look to Miss S, so worried that she will cry, but instead she laughs and then goes on about how running makes her feel good. After we have all finished explaining who we are, Miss S calls me over to her desk. You really wrote a novel? She asks. Yes, I say. It is called The Challenge. May I read it? Yes, you may read it. I will brink it. <clears throat> And brink it, I do, <laughs> with the worried admonition, please don't lose Miss S, okay? <laughs> and then it happens. At the end of the English period, when a book about a mouse who has learned how to fly in an airplane has been thoroughly dissected, Miss S announces, and now Gary will read from his novel. His what? 
Oh, but it doesn't matter because I'm standing there holding my composition notebook straight from the Square Deal notebook, people of Dayton, Ohio, zip code 45463. And looking out at me are the boys beneath their little flying saucer yarmulkes and the girls with their sweet aromatic bangs, their blouses studded with stars. And there's Miss S, who I'm already terribly in love with, but who I recently learned has a fiancé, not sure what that means, can't be good. <laughs> but whose bright American face is not just encouraging me, but priding me on. Am I scared? No, I am eager, eager to begin my life. Introduction, I say. The mysterious wraiths. Before the age of dinosaurs, there was human life on Earth. They looked just like the man of today, but they were a lot more intelligent than the man of today. Slowly, Miss S says. Read slowly, Gary. Let us enjoy the words. I breathe that in. Miss S wants to enjoy my words. <laughs> and then I continue slower. They built all kinds of spaceships and other wonders, but at that time, the Earth circled the moon because the moon was bigger than the Earth. One day, a gigantic comet came and blew up the moon to the size it is today. As I'm reading it, I'm hearing a different language come out of my mouth. I do full justice to the many errors. The Earth circled the moon, and the Russian accent is still thick. But, what I am, but I am speaking in what is more or less comprehensible English. And as I am speaking, along with my strange new English voice, I am also hearing something entirely foreign to the squealing and shouting that constitutes the background noise of my Hebrew school. Silence. The children are silent. They are listening to my every word. And they will listen to the story for the next five weeks as well, because Miss S will designate the end of every English period as Gary Novel Time. <laughs> And they will shout out throughout the English period, when will Gary read already? <laughs> the school is close to Long Island. Uh, and I will sit there in my chair, oblivious to all but Miss S's smile, excused from following the discussion of the mouse who learned how to fly, so that I may go over the words I will soon read to my adoring audience. And God bless these kids for giving me a chance. May their God bless them, everyone. So were you essentially doomed from that moment? You had a taste of what it was to have an audience? I had a taste of what it was to uh, have an audience. But the first audience I ever had was my grandmother in Leningrad. Uh, she was a, a writer for Evening Leningrad, uh, which was the, the highbrow paper. Morning Leningrad was for losers. Uh, <laughs> And she was a staunch communist, and she, uh, there was a huge statue of Lenin, the biggest statue of Lenin in Leningrad, uh, and we called him the Latin Lenin, because he looked like he was about to rumba, you know, he had this look. <laughs> and I loved him so much, and I would, whenever, on mornings when I wasn't dying of asthma, I would wake up and hug his the pe pedestal. Uh, and so she said, when I was five, she said, do you want to write a novel? You know, typical Russian question. <laughs> Uh, who do you like more, Turgenev or Chekhov, you know? Uh, so I said, all right, I'll, I'll write a book. And she said, I'll pay you a piece of cheese. I love this cheese for each page you write. Uh, even today, Penguin Australia pays me in cheese, so it's uh, <laughs> come full circle. Um, so I wrote a 100-page book for 100 pieces of cheese, and it was called Lenin and His Magical Goose. And it was the story of Lenin meeting this magical goose from, I think, Armenia. And they flew to Finland. Lenin flew on the goose's you know, body. And they invaded Finland and created a socialist revolution there. Um, and then Lenin eats the goose because the goose is Menshevik. Uh, <laughs> and I remember my grandmother saying, well, maybe he doesn't eat the goose. Maybe he just exiles the goose to Mexico. And then, you know, ice pick, ice pick. <laughs> so that was sort of my political education. Did you, do you still have a copy of Lenin and the Magical Goose? No, that's sadly. I have a copy of what I wrote in Hebrew school, the Gonorrah, which was my version of the Torah, <laughs> where, you know, Exodus became Sexodus, and instead of Sarah, the Jewish nation was born through a Brooks Shieldowitz, so the, <laughs> the famous Jewish matriarch. So it wasn't, it wasn't just having an audience, it was also being a class clown. Yeah, clown. oh yeah, oh absolutely, absolutely. I mean... This is when I made my first American friends. Nobody would talk to me. I, wouldn't, I would sit in the corner of the lunchroom whispering to Russian, you know, uh, to myself, uh, eating forbidden pork products in the corner. Uh, there was one rabbi who would burst in, and we would, we, the Russian kids would eat it in the, in the uh, bathroom, and he would burst in and say things like, it's because of you the Holocaust happened. <laughs> and I was thinking, how can I go back in time and not eat this pork? But it's so tasty. <laughs> mm. I'm just, I, I asked the question about keeping the manuscript, because it strikes me, you know, uh, 
Those There's stories that you could bring out of Russia, you had you know a 10 kilogram weight limit. So we thought that you know the one ABBA record we had, Money Money, would uh, would be more important than, than Lenin and his magical goose. But for for all you you know, the book dwells on the many ways in which your parents weren't encouraging, but they did keep early writing. They did you know surely that's a suggestion. There was a certain amount of pride in what you were doing. There was. I mean, they you know they were they keep. Their way of sort of talking about it is that I was a perfect kid until. And I think the until part is really when I started to have ideas of my own. Uh, I grew up in a very conservative family, and I was a very conservative kid. Uh, I was certainly incredibly conservative through Hebrew school. And then I was sent to uh, Stuyvesant, which is a math and science high school in Manhattan. I had never, we grew up in far, far Queens. I thought that the four skyscrapers in, on Queens Boulevard, that that was Manhattan. We were, we were that sheltered, you know. And then I finally saw the sky, and I was like, holy crap, I can't believe, uh, you know, there's a whole city beyond Queens. Um, and I just fell in love with it immediately, and, and I met my first, you know, non-Jewish kids, and it was incredibly multicultural, 70% Asian, actually, because, you know, and Russian, because Russians and Asians are the only ones who can do math and science. Uh, <laughs> so... You know, it was, uh, and I just fell in love with it, and, and, and that's when I began to change. I began to become a different person, and I began to become an American, I think, in a sense, is the right word for it. Not a native-born American, because they were always in the background of my mind, but somebody who thought like an American. And that's very clear in Little Failure. I mean, the book is very much about your relationship with your Russianness, I think, and the way in which your rising Americanness sees you move away from your parents yeah. and try and reconcile that. Well, you know, as I said, I, I tried to pretend I was German in Hebrew school, but then I went to this very Marxist-Leninist, very stoned college called Oberlin College in Ohio. The photos make the photos, it very... Yeah, there's a photo of me with hair down in my ass, which is quite beautiful, um, or not. Um, but, you know, and, and when I got there, being ethnic was what everybody wanted to be, because it was... So all of a sudden, I started wearing the whole Cossack outfit with, you know... <laughs> the bullets across my chest and making borscht whenever, you know, at the drop of a hat. A vegan borscht, of course, and lactose-tolerant borscht, but still <laughs> borscht, you know. The, um, all three of your first three books deal very much, as you said, with Russian identity, and then this book is you kind of unpicking it yourself. To what extent does the memoir come out of the process of uh, analysis and therapy. <laughs> psychoanalysis. Yeah. Well, look, I'm not one of those crazy people that goes five times a week to psychoanalysis. I go four times. Uh, <laughs> so I'm something of a rebel in the psychoanalytic community. <laughs> uh, the wild child of psychoanalysis. And it's only been 15 years. Uh, so <laughs> this may be the final year, actually, which is very sad. Psychoanalysis allows you to sort of self-publish. You, you say something in the air, and it kind of floats in front of your face, and you think, Wait a minute, did I just say that? And when you say it in English also, you see the, you see the craziness of it as it would relate to you know, an American audience. I mean, part of having this book out is, in, in, touring around America is, some of the, America, the native-born audience will say, I can't believe they called you Little Failure, those jerks, you know? And then the Russians will come up of my age and say, Little Failure, that's nothing, I'm Little Shithead, you know? <laughs> or, or they're crying and saying, can you sign this book to a failed paralegal? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So what it is, is a really, again, it's, it's just a culture clash. These are two, you know, one is the 21st century way of child rearing in Manhattan, and then there's the 19th century child rearing of the, of the Soviet Union, which never really went, I mean, psycho, any form of psychology never entered the, the Soviet Union beyond being used to torture dissidents. So, you know, I, there's this line in my book when I tell my, parent, my father I'm in psychoanalysis, and he says, I'd rather you were gay. <laughs> And I say, well, you know what, Dad? Um, I'm a gay psycho in Alessand. Put that on your borscht. Super sad love story. Super sad true love story, sorry. Um, uh, is partly from the point of view of Lenny Abramov, who's very familiar Gary Steingart creation, but also partly from the perspective of Eunice Park, who's quite a departure for you. And it, it yeah. feels like uh, you're doing something very different and writing a voice as far removed from your own as you have at any point. You then go from that to a memoir. 
Yes, I had an imagination for one book, and then I just said the hell with it. Uh, <laughs> Super Sad did have a, a, a Korean-American character that I'm quite proud of myself. I don't know if anyone would, everyone would agree. Um, but most of that book was outsourced to India, so I, I wrote very little of it. Uh, <laughs> a guy named Pratik in Bangalore really did a fine job. Uh, he wrote part of this memoir, too. You'll notice there are scenes in Leningrad that suddenly segue to a woman in a sari making dal. <laughs> and you're like, where the hell did that come from? But, he earned his 30 rupees an hour. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You didn't earn your chase, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Very corrupt. But I, I'm interested, because in Little Failure, you subscribe to Isaac Asimov's science fiction uh, magazine. magazine. Yeah. And you know, in those stories you read as an early writer, there's clearly an interest in a kind of science fiction-y background. And in Super Sad, you give over to that. You set it in the immediate future, um, and it's recognizable, but it's also a kind of alternate reality. Well, my mentor, Chang Ri Lee, the wonderful Korean-American writer, said at one point, we were being interviewed, he said, all immigrant novels are dystopian science fiction. Because, you know, you come to a different planet, and you have to make do, and you're the alien. And, I mean, talk about E.T., the extraterrestrial, that's, that's you, and, except with more hair, you know. Uh, and, and, and that's how I felt about writing that dystopian fiction. Having it from, from the point of view of a Russian immigrant and a Korean immigrant felt really Right, and I enjoyed writing, uh, uh, having a, somebody of different gender so much. My next book is all going to be just a very attractive woman uh, as, the, as the protagonist. Uh, vaguely based on yourself. Vaguely based on myself or who I wish I was, yeah. <laughs> That's another 15 years of psychoanalysis. Uh, um, uh, the, I mentioned before that, you know, Absurdistan in particular is a book that reads like it comes from a place of kind of anger and sadness, and uh, Super Sad is also motivated by a kind of clearly felt concern about society, about where it's going, about the things we value, about what we're doing with it. Do you think of yourself as an angry person? <laughs> wow, that only took half an hour to get to that. Um, no, I, I mean, I think uh, all the drugs I take have made me quite mellow. <laughs> I barely know I'm here at this point. Uh, um, as I said, you know, the, the memoir did take some of the anger out. I mean, the anger in those books was not just directed against the family unit, it was directed at the former Soviet Union. And I think the anger I felt toward the former Soviet Union is the anger of doing what it did to my parents. So when I turned, in, when I was in my 20s, I started going back almost every year to Russia because I wanted to understand why are these people walking down the streets, not just without a smile on their face, but with this strange subterranean smirk just looking right past you. And there I was, like an idiot American, going, hi, everyone, <laughs> nice borscht, everyone, you know, and, and, and people would just look at me like I was, I mean, they could tell I speak Russian, but as soon as I had that smile on my face, they knew that there was something deeply wrong with me. And I began to make friends, and, and, and some of my best friendships are still with Russians, and uh, there, not in America, but, but, but in, in Russia. And I sort of started to think, what would have happened to me had I remained there instead of being brought out of Russia at age seven? One scenario, I'd be dead in the Red Army after being hazed. I mean, you know, all 124 <laughs> pounds of me <laughs> being put through that uh, meat grinder. But the other option is I could have been a billionaire oligarch, uh, like so many of my other fellow Jews, uh, living mostly in London and Switzerland, uh, instead of writing this crap. Uh, so it was very in interesting to see those two paths that people took uh, from my generation of, of Russian Jews. Can you still write in Russian? No, uh, I can read the reviews, which are always wonderful. Uh, the last book was uh, Balding Traitor Betrays Motherland. That was. Uh, <laughs> That was a good review. Uh, it was pretty positive. There was Steingart Pleases His American Masters. Uh, that was pretty good, too. Uh, uh, so uh, the first three books have been translated into Russian. So your parents have read those three. Yeah, yeah. Supportive? At my wedding, the uh, fiction editor of The New Yorker came to my father and said, so what do you think of Gary's books? And he said, eh, the first one is OK. <laughs> so yeah, very supportive. <laughs> For Russian parents, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was almost crying. I was like, thank you, Dad. It's okay. <laughs> but you said before you don't think Little Failure will be translated into Russian. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that might be trickier going, that one. Yeah, that would be tricky. Um, one of the, the themes in Super Sad that's touched upon a bit and it's clearly important to you is 
about the death of reading. Lenny is uh, kind of roundly mocked for being someone who loves his books and no. cares about his yeah. books. Are you concerned about the future of reading? <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> terribly so. I mean, I think long form reading is just very difficult for people, especially of the next generation, to do. It's just, it's hard for me to do. I mean, I'm so, I'm on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, please, uh, so much, and Instagram, that uh, <laughs> it, it is harder to, to read. I'll, I'll show you an example. I mean, I was being driven to upstate New York to do a lecture at a college, and I, we were going into the mountains, and I was reading a great book uh, by, it was called Five Star Billionaire. It's, some of you may have read it. Tish Aw uh, is just Chinese, Malaysian Chinese writer. And um, it's a great book, but I was having so much difficulty reading it in the car because my eye telephone was going off, my Google Glass was broadcasting images at me. And I thought, this book is too hard, and it's probably not well written, and I don't understand any of these characters, because that's how we read now. Then we got into the mountains, and the signal died, because America's a third world country where we don't have cell towers uh, outside of you know, Manhattan. So, and all of a sudden, without all my devices, I started to read the book the way we used to read books, with nothing but this kind of Vulcan mind meld between you and the mind of another author. So all of a sudden, I was entering the mind of uh, a Chinese, of a Malaysian woman uh, in, uh, in Shanghai, you know. And the language became clear, and, I, and, and the plot line became clear, but I thought, this is a beautiful book. And all it took was for me to get, rid, get out of the digital ghetto that I was in, for me to fully understand what I was missing. And that, I think, is the problem, in terms of what all these devices have done uh, to our appreciation of the book. Super Sad, which is about the you know, future where books, young people think books smell and are terrible and, 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 and nobody reads anymore. Uh, we, uh, what happened, the, the sort of, the genesis of that was that I was, my cable television was on the fritz and I had to call a repairman. And so the repairman comes and he's a young guy in his 20s, Jamaican accent, and like the protagonist Lenny, I had this gigantic wall of books across one of my walls. And he walked in and he said, oh man, why you got all them books here? <laughs> like it was the most disgusting thing ever. <laughs> and then he said, and such a small TV. <laughs> It was this emasculating thing. My TV is so small. But... And then he looked at the books and said, well, at least you got them all orderly. Like, <laughs> so like, keep them in their prison, those disgusting things. Um, and I thought, wow. I mean, people really don't like books as much as they used to when I was, when I was a kid. You're famously supportive of other writers. There's even a blog called Gary Steingart Blurbs, uh, which has gathered all the various blurbs you've given other authors on the front of their books. Is that part of trying to stem that flow against reading, trying to? Well, I've had to retire this year because it got out of control. I mean, I would come back from vacation and be like 300 books waiting for me to be blurbed. Blurbed is the little thing in the back that says, not since Tolstoy has there been a novel about pooping this great, you know. <laughs> uh, so I did 150 books. That's a lot of blurbs. Um, look, you know, you want to help young writers, especially in terms of literary fiction where the audiences are dwindling and you want to, you want to give them that extra push. I was so honored because Chang Ray Lee, who I mentioned before, the Korean American writer, was my teacher at Hunter College. And when I started the program, he's two weeks into the program, he said, I can get you a book deal. And he got me a book deal. And I thought, if I could do that for other people in any sense, just move them along. This is not a growing industry. You know, let me help them out. And that's what I've been doing, uh, to the point where it almost be, has become you know, performance art. <laughs> But now you've retired it. They can all go get stuff. I will still blur books by my former students, by owners of long-haired dachshunds. Um, <laughs> anyone whose last name is Lipschitz will be blurbed, <laughs> just because it has to be. Uh, and, uh, and Ukrainians, because of what's happened politically. Um, <laughs> I feel bad about Crimea. Do you reread books? Yeah, some, some. You know, the good ones. <laughs> what, are the, what are the ones you go back to a lot? Um, Nabokov's Pnin, or Nabokov, as they call him, the Napster. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I love Lolita and, and Pale Fire, which are the usual two, uh, but I think Pnin is the most humane work. I teach that at Columbia in a class called Immigrants A Go Go. Um, <laughs> Sorry, is that real? <laughs> that's a real class. I also teach a class called The Hysterical Male, which is about, uh, you know, just unhappy white men <laughs> ranting about their supposed unhappiness. And, and that well, class someone's is, covered that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> and the class is mostly women trying to understand their boyfriends. Uh. <laughs> how, how important is comedy and satire to you? 
Well, to me, a comedy and satire, that's the sort of the ICBM, the intercontinental ballistic missile that delivers the sadness. That's, the, that's where you package the sadness into, and then you just press that red button and hope for the best. Uh, um, but I am, uh, I mean, I think that humor works only when it's about sadness. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, physical comedy, which can be sad also. <laughs> uh, it can be very sad in my case. Uh, but it's, I think that, you know, Jewish humor, the humor I grew up with is this kind of humor from the edge of the grave. Uh, I grew up with Jews in the Soviet Union telling me Brezhnev jokes. That was my intro to what humor could be. There's one joke that I remember so well. It was 1980, the Moscow Olympics. Brezhnev, who was completely senile at this point, barely there, had to deliver the opening speech. So he gets up on the podium, and somebody hands him a piece of paper, and he starts reading. And his assistant runs up and says, oh, Comrade General Secretary, uh, those are just the Olympic rings. <laughs> So you start with humor like that, which is, you know, political, satirical, performative. It's everything you want humor to be. Whereas Little Failure, it's the missile seems to be sadness and love, with the payload being the humor there to kind of soften. We it. switched it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's a very different book. Um, you know, it was very difficult to write uh, because each morning I'd wake up and I'd say, okay, you know, I'm 11 years old again today, what's my day like? And I would spend the first three days basically reliving what it was like. And again, my parents were very helpful in that they saved so much of that stuff that it was, it was there in front of me. And I interviewed them for a long time. I took them back to Russia. I go back all the time. My father hadn't been back in 30 years. Uh, and that was a very, very sad trip because the last chapter of the book is about all the things I didn't know about their, and I want to give anything away, but horrifying, horrifying things. Um, and I came back from that trip, and, and we were supposed to go to Hawaii with my family, and uh, I was just miserable in Hawaii. I was just sitting there on this beach, and I felt like I had just been hit by so many bricks, so many red bricks, and it was... Uh, it took a lot of Zoloft to get out of that tailspin, but, but that's when I realized what this book was going to be and what the arc, as they say in Hollywood, of the book was going to be. To my mind, one of the most beautiful things about the book is what a kind of declaration of love for your parents it is. And um, it, at the end, not to give anything away, there's a gorgeous photo of them that I imagine is relatively recent. Um, uh, but at the very start of the book, there's an account of you uh, missing your father. And it's really beautiful and really kind of sad, and I wondered how much being a father yourself now mm. informed the way you approached and wrote that. It's tough because, you know, there were things obviously about that brand of child rearing that I don't want to continue because it was so a part of a certain time and space mostly, you know, which, by which I mean the Soviet Union. But there's so much that I want to continue that doesn't exist so much in Manhattan where you know, I see my fellow parents and you know, they see their children once every three years because they're off to, their hedge fund keeps sending them to you know, buy up a piece of uh, Malaysia or whatever. Um, so I want to have, and, and the beautiful thing about growing up with Soviet parents is nobody did anything. Like work was you know, 30 minutes a day of you know, being drunk in some office and then you went home and spent time with your kids. So I would spend time with my parents all the time um, because that's what was expected. And, and I would never give, I, those m moments mean so much to me. You know, my father teaching me about literature, taking me around the, the Hermitage in, in St. Petersburg. Um, all these things were, made me who I am more than anything else that happened. Um, so I guess I would love to be, you know, underemployed uh, so that I could spend more time with, with my kids so that I can, and I think I started writing this book when I knew we were going to have a kid because I thought, you know, that boy or a girl, I wanted them to know exactly what made their father uh, who he is. And that's, hopefully, that the book did the trick, I hope. There's a chance for you to ask some questions of Gary now. There is a microphone, possibly even two microphones, that are going to make their way to you. So I'd ask you to put your hand up and wait till the microphone gets to you, just to make sure everyone, mainly us, can hear what you're asking. Uh, 
You're doing a very good job of not starting the questions before the microphone comes, but you do need to put your hand up. Ah, excellent. One over here. Questions or complaints? Hi, Gary. Um, what kind of, can you describe your teaching approach and perhaps <laughs> what kind of legacy you think you'll leave through the future published writing of your students? Well, uh, the approach I have is quite unorthodox. I allow alcohol in class. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, especially single malts. Um, so it's a very raucous class. It almost feels like it, it could be a class, you know, uh, in, the, in the, it feels like it could be the 1920s. Um, everyone is a little soused, and that makes people much more honest. Uh, I had a wonderful Melburnian student this semester, and he just spoke his mind. Uh, <laughs> wonderful times. Um, we'll never write a word, but it was good. <laughs> no, it was great. He was really great. Uh, he was talking about, he wrote about the Melbourne art world, uh, which apparently is quite large. Um, and uh, it's, it's a democracy. In America, we have the Socratic method in these workshops, and so everyone just talks. I'm just one of the students, basically. I'm just an older, balder student, uh, in a sense. Um, and so it's just very free-ranging. There's no theme. People bring in their work, and they just discuss whatever happened. Uh, we have amazing students at Columbia. James Franco was a student of mine. I mean, uh, <laughs> you can't beat that. Uh, look up my, I did a video where I play his husband. Uh, and we make out for a while. Uh, 68 takes it took for that. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm saying is Columbia encourages the kissing of your students. Uh, it's a hands-on education. Um, what else are my, my uh, teaching methods? Well, you know, look, every, in, in America, to be a writer, you have to have a Master's of Fine Arts degree now. In the old days, you did have to fight in the Spanish Civil War, but <laughs> this is less bloody and... Uh, and more lucrative for the university. So 54,000 a year, uh, hmm, not bad. Your Tony Abbott is raising prices, but these are, not, these are beyond the body and prices for an education. Uh, by the way, I just realized this trip that liberal here doesn't mean what I thought it is. <laughs> oh my god, I, I always thought that you had these liberal prime ministers. You know, I was like, oh my god, this, Jacobs, this uh, Howard guy sounds incredibly liberal. Uh, but live it's and like learn. the water going the other way down the drain. With Quite My confused. God, shocking. Sorry, that was not a great answer to your question, but I think we covered the important things. So. <laughs> and then there's one down here. The microphone's coming to you now, so. Any second. I ask you to explore a bit more about the duality of heritage. So you go to Russia, you've got both a mixed feeling of have some pride in everything cultural and historical that comes through you, but equally that very negativity about an experience, and I'm just wondering if you can explore that. It's a really interesting question. You know, when we came to America, my parents said that our, look, our, our heritage these Americans are rich, and we should emulate them, but culturally, they're not quite up to snuff. You know, they don't have, they don't got no Dostoevsky, and, and uh, although we all enjoyed the book called Gekelberry Finn. Uh, <laughs> love Gekelberry, with an introduction by Joseph Stalin, no less, in the Russian <laughs> version. Um, when I go to Russia, so there is this incredible feeling. Look, I think Russian literature, of course I'm biased, is the best literature of the 19th century. That's for me, the high water mark of literature. Some would say French literature of the 19th century, and, or British literature of the 19th century, or Peter Carey, um, <laughs> whom I know back in, in New York. Sorry, name dropping time. Um, but, you know, um, but the rest of the country is a disaster of untold proportions. And when people ask me to predict the future of Russia, you don't have to be that smart. It's, it's going to be a disaster. Um, what it's going to be? Will it be a, a feudal, the worst feudalism in the world? Will it be the worst uh, socialism in the world? Will it be the worst turbo capitalism, which they are kleptocracy in the world? Whatever it is, it will be the worst. Uh, there's a restaurant in St. Petersburg called 1913, and I asked the owner why 1913, and she said that was the only good year in Russian history. <laughs> you know. And that's it. And, and the thing is, of course, one loves Russia because it's a country that suffers so much that you can't not love it. And, and, and that also helped produce the amazing literature that has continued to this day. Uh, I got into a terrible spat because at a drunken interview, I, I offended Canadian literature for being boring. I'm so sorry. I love Alice Munro. Uh, it's, it's not boring. But the point I was trying to make was, I think, that uh, greatly unequal societies often per, uh, create wonderful literature because the conflict, you know, literature thrives on conflict. And it can be the internal conflict, it can be family conflict, but what the other, the third conflict is the societal conflict. And a place like Russia is amazing. It is 
the birthplace of satire in a sense, because satire works best when evil and stupidity collide. <laughs> the W. Bush years were pretty good too. Yeah. <laughs> Gary, are there contemporary Russian writers you read? Sure, sure. And I don't know how well they're translated, which is a big problem. Uh, Vladimir Sorokin is the preeminent uh, satirist. Viktor Pilevin is somebody people may know. Tatiana Tolstoy, see, uh, blank stares. Um, it's very sad. There is, there's very, very little being translated. Uh, I mean, or, or when translated, it's sold you know, in batches of 100 copies in, in America. Although 100 copies is a bestseller in the United States, given our reading habits. So. There's a question, just. Uh, hi, Gary. Hi. Um, love your work. Thank um, you. I, uh, I just recently married a Russian. I wondered if you've got any advice for me? Beside <laughs> <laughs> me here. Oh, oh. Uh, well, I was just watching the show called The Americans. Have you seen that? It's about a KGB spy couple. And uh, it's a great show. And, um, and this, this FBI agent is about to elope with a KGB agent, and he asked his handler, uh, uh, and and the, the, her handler, the KGB guy, says, one piece of advice, don't tell her I love you all the time like you Americans do. <laughs> Which is wrong. I love being told I love you, you know, by, by anybody. Or I love me. Or you love me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is the problem of being an only child. Uh, <laughs> I love me. Um, <laughs> Well, I don't know. I think Russian women don't like to be tickled. That's what I learned from my mother. Uh, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> Good luck. Such fonts of wisdom there. You're, yeah. you're lucky you asked. Keep your hands behind you. So clearly the scope is pretty wide for questions you have. <laughs> Marriage advice. Uh, <laughs> there's one there, and then we'll get to this one up here in a sec. Hi, Gary. I really enjoyed your book, Little Failures. Um, uh, my husband's parents were Russian. Yeah. And um, one thing I thought was uh, interesting was the um, Russian words were written in English. I can't explain it. So I actually couldn't read them because I recognised some of those words in Cyrillic, like um, Abteka and Sanuk. But there was one word which was descriptive of a mother. And I was lying in bed, a mother or something. And I, so I showed it to my husband and I said, what's this word? And he sounded it out in his head, realised it was Russian but written in English, and then looked at me and said, my God, what are you reading? Anyway, <laughs> uh, and so I'm encouraging him to read the book as well. Thanks very much for oh, that. Thank, oh, thank you. Uh, well, this is interesting because Putin just banned in, in, art, in the arts. Um, there's four major Russian words for this. There's the act of copulating, there's each of the genitals, and uh, there's a whole, uh, pr a word for prostitute. And those are used, uh, about 30% of Russian interactions comprise of those four words. <laughs> uh, and, and Putin just banned them. Um, which will make communication in Russia very small, you know. Uh, but I was glad to, uh, to, to put those words in there. Y yes, proper Russians aren't supposed to use those words. And the first uh, Russian debutante's hand job, whatever that book was that I wrote, the first book, <laughs> Um, the translator was this very proper uh, Petersburg lady, and she, whenever there was a, any one of those words, she would just put the first letter, let's say, and then dot, 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 dot. So that book was also very short. Uh, was sort of a pamphlet in Russian, you know. Did you, uh, in the translation process into Russian, did you get invested because you had yeah, a bit of a I state? Did, I did. And my main job was, my, I mean, their Russian was better than my Russian, but my main, main job was sort of getting the American idioms over and, and trying to get them to the best. Mm -hmm. And explaining, you know, terms about Brooklyn that nobody understands outside of Brooklyn. How did Absurdistan in particular go in Russian? Well, it did the best out of all those books, but it also, that was Balding Trader Betrays Motherland. Yeah, right. they were upset. And one of the comments was very interesting. It was, um, it was a sort of positive review, but it said, it would be okay for him to make fun of us if he lived here, but you can't just move to New York and make fun of us. That's, that's a betrayal. Seems fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Judas. Judas. Uh, now, there was a question just here. The microphone is coming to you, I think, D down the aisle. Talk amongst yourselves. Ah, nice weather we're having. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. There's been a lot of discussion about whether an MFA is actually useful. Um, so I was wondering if you could um, talk about some of the pros and cons from your opinion about 
whether to get one? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, so the New Yorker had the 20 under 40 issue that just came out, and, and, or came out a few years ago, so 20 of the best writers under 40. I was still under 40 at that point, I've crossed that Rubicon since then. Uh, but 17 of us were MFA holders, 17 out of 20. And the other three had studied creative writing, I think, on the undergraduate level. So put that on your pipe and smoke it, right? Um, so that's the plus side. Uh, the negative side is that often the stories do all sound the same because you're, uh, there's almost a feeling of, you're, there's a committee of 12 that are judging your work. Uh, interesting enough, you know, so I got my book deal for Handjob when I was, right before I started uh, my MFA program. And the, the Chang Ray Lee said, don't tell anyone that you have um, you know, a book deal, let's just workshop. We already had the sort of published version. Just workshop that and just don't listen, don't care. And the students hated it. You know, they hated what was going to be that book. Uh, and they kept saying, oh, it's, well, when there was a British woman, I can't do the accent. She said, it's clever by half, clever by half. <laughs> uh -huh. Don't sell yourself short. You did that accent very well. It was a good, yeah, it was clever great. by half. <laughs> yeah. It's fun to do that brain sound as well. Um, like and then when it was <laughs> down to the heavy, up yeah, to uh, I haven't seen that yet, but but now I'm ready. Um, <laughs> and then I finally announced they, the school announced that you know it was a, a big book deal, and everyone said, "Oh, it's great! It's great! Who's your agent? This is spectacular prose." So the danger is that you're writing for a committee of people, and and that may sort of shorten your voice, may take away, you may do the sort of typical story that's out there in a, in a big magazine like the Paris Review or something, and and that's good, but also could diminish your idiosyncrasies. So. Good and bad. How much does it mean that you get typecast as a certain kind of writer? You know, do you get put in the immigrant writer? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but know. the immigrant writer is good. Uh, people love that crap. Oh my God, in America? Because we hate writers by actual foreigners because they probably smell or something. <laughs> but an immigrant is sort of halfway, you know, nice and you know, combed, but at the same time, and speak his English real good. Um, so that's what we love. Uh, John Palahiri, Juno Diaz, Amy Tan, of course, who's here. Uh, they do very, very well. And there was a question back there in the middle. Yes. Oh, hello. I, reading your book, um, was very much like listening to your chat now. The character came through very well. Uh, I also found I got very anxious, as well as vastly entertained, I got very anxious in parts, but when you were obviously wasting your youth and wasting your, your talents. But at the Wasted end... Wasting my youth? <laughs> wasting your youth At the university when you were a student. Um, but now I got to the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Got to the end of the book, and you used t t uh, a sentence which, unfortunately, I did write it down but left it at home. And you said two words which make me now want to read it again under a sh the shadow. The two words were a uh, two phrase in a sentence you talked about the cold stillness that had always been inside you. and it threw a sort of a veil over the whole book and I want to read it, not so much as a laugh and um, a stressful, <laughs> worrying situation, yeah. but that perpetual thing that seems to be inside. Thank you. Could you uh, explain? Thank you. Uh, thank you for worrying about me. That's very, very <laughs> sweet of you. Um, it ended up okay. <laughs> 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 Uh, the cold stillness. I don't even remember writing that, but that does sound good. Uh, that could have been outsourced to India. Um, <laughs> damn you, Pratik, you're much better than I am. <laughs> um, look, if you're a writer and you grew up with happy parents, happy childhood, your stock portfolio is doing great, uh, you know, you live in a beautiful sunny place, uh, the quality of Thai food is amazing, um, <laughs> You've never had hair loss. Um, you're a great swimmer. I, mean, I can go on. I don't know what you're going to write about, honestly. I mean, it's possible, but what's it going to be? The writers I know are, are some of the most miserable people I know. More miserable than the visual artists, which says something. <laughs> More miserable than filmmakers, except for four. Um, Buzz Lerman, where are you? Um, so. The pain has to be there. And that sounds like a cliche, oh, the pain artist. But something has to need to be, if you're a writer and you don't need to do what you're doing, this is why I never understood writer's block. Writer's what? 
this stuff needs to get out of me. You know, this is, this is life and death for me. Um, and I think it is for most other writers I know. Uh, this often leads to outrageous behavior, horrible, as you've read in the book, terrible amounts of drug use, especially in, in, during the college years uh, and, and through the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but, but, but when it works is when you don't have to use horse tranquilizer uh, on you, but when you can sublimate it into a chapter uh, and, and wake up feeling like You've done something, and you're a part of the human race. Or the wombat race, which is also lovely. But given that, um, you've said that writing memoir was partly about purging some of this stuff, partly about getting it out there. Where do you go next as a writer? Is there... <laughs> Hollywood. Um, <laughs> they're adapting, trying to adapt Super Sad as a, as a TV series, and I'm one of the co-writers. Are you going to uh, star as, uh, as Lenny? Uh, two words, Paul Giamatti. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Giamatti as Lenny, and James Franco playing the 70-year-old who looks like he's 30, uh, Joshy. Oh, that would be terrific. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, and, but yes, where do I go next? Well, it's a good question. Uh, and this could be the end of me, but... I don't think so. I think I want to write, I mean, I, uh, these aren't exactly novels of ideas, but I've been influenced by certain things. Uh, Absurdistan is about ex-Soviet politics and the oil industry. Um, Super Sad is about technology. Um, and the book I'm writing now is really more about, uh, it's about the, the way the financial industry controls large part, parts of our society, by which I mean America, but also across the globe. So <laughs> I, I, I'm hanging out with a lot of hedge fund people. Uh, no and they always pay for dinner. I love them. Uh, <laughs> no trouble finding the sadness there, then. The sadness of the hedgy, yes. <laughs> uh, they struggle so much. I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm so sorry if you had a question, but you can. Gary will be signing copies of his books at the shop. He'll also sign asthma inhalers uh, if you want that done. Please join I'll me. I'll sign in. your Thank inhalers, you. too. Thank you. Gary Steingart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>